Welcome to the Spirit Sisters podcast. My name is Karina Machado and I'm the author of Spirit Sisters, Women's True Stories of the Paranormal. In this podcast, I'll revisit the women behind my most unforgettable stories and unearth new tales to chill, intrigue, astound and offer hope. You'll hear first-hand accounts of ghostly visitors, near-death experiences, premonitions, hauntings and love more powerful than death. Whatever you believe about the afterlife, I invite you to open your minds and hearts as ordinary women reveal their extraordinary encounters. Little girls love a sleepover. It's so much fun to swap secrets, giggle about the cutest boy in class, give the Barbies an extreme makeover. It's also a rite of passage, proof that you're growing up, a way to show mum and dad that you can sleep away from your bed and blankie, can face alone those fears that creep into your room cloaked in moonlight. Once the muffled giggling and whispering fades out, when eyelids begin to droop, lashes quivering over peachy, pillow-warm cheeks. Then little girls sleep like the dead. Not with them, usually, but not all sleepovers are the same. Hello and welcome to the first full episode of the Spirit Sisters podcast. You've just heard me read the opening lines of a story called The Family, which features in the first chapter of Spirit Sisters. Now, this was a story that crept under my skin, and there it stayed. Doing publicity for Spirit Sisters and later for the next two books in the series, Where Spirits Dwell and Love Never Dies, I was often asked to share my favourite ghost story that an interviewee had gifted me. Even though I've had the pleasure of hearing so many wonderful first-hand accounts of apparitions and other marvels, it was the family I'd bring up every time. Even the other day, telling my 17-year-old son about it in the kitchen, I could feel goosebumps rising as I told him the true life tale of a sleepover with a difference. That's messed up, he said, his dark eyes wide. So it goes without saying that I'm overjoyed you're with me today to listen in to my catch-up conversation with Amy, more than a decade after she'd first told me about the chilling experience that took place when she was a little girl. Today, Amy, who lives in New South Wales, is a teacher and a very busy mum of four, So I was delighted that she carved out time to speak with me again. Now, settle in as Amy tells you a story you'll never forget. So Amy, it is so, so lovely to be speaking with you again. It is good to be speaking with you too. (laughs) And so much has happened in your life since we caught up that memorable day in the QVB. Uh, it definitely, definitely has. Um, lots of changes in my life. I have four beautiful children now. Um, I've changed careers. I'm a teacher. Yeah, so I'm teaching kindergarten. Last year was my first year, and so I'm teaching kindergarten again this year. And my daughter actually starts kindergarten, my first going to school. <laughs> That's amazing. So you must be so busy with four children. It's a very different life to the one you had as a young student. If I remember correctly, when we chatted, you were studying uh, forensic pathology or something like that? Policing. Policing, yes. As I spoke a little bit in the intro, your story is um, the one that you shared with me that day in the QVB is probably up there with the five most fascinating stories I've heard in over 10 years of writing about spiritual paranormal matters, mysterious occurrences. And it's the one I always offer to people when they ask me about what's the the most unforgettable story that you can think of. So I'm so delighted to be catching up with you today. And um, I want to ask you again about the experience. So how much do you reflect on that day? What happened to you when you were a little girl on that sleepover? Uh, probably not as much as I, I used to because life is so much busier. Yes, um, yes. But, you know, I, I do think about it, you know, on and off every now and then and, like, nothing like that has happened to me since, like, in that magnitude. But, you know, I always wonder who they were and, 
and what happened to them. But it's it's something that I've thought, well, I, something I'll probably never know. Mm. And I wonder how you would feel about recounting the experience now for our listeners who perhaps haven't heard your story or haven't read my book. In your own words, would you describe again what happened on that night, on that sleepover? Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, I I spent a lot of time over at our neighbour's house. You know, I grew up with them. They lived across across the road and this one night we were, I was sharing a, a a bed with um, my my friend, and I've woken up in the middle of the night, and I've gone to the bathroom, and I've come back, and as I laid back down, I looked up, and there were the this family of three: um, a father, a mother, and a little boy. And I'm not sure how long we stared at each other, but it, it felt like a really long time. And I was scared out of my mind. Wow. Like I felt like I was I was frozen in in, in fright. Uh, and the mother has leant down to the little boy and whispered something in his in his ear, and he's he's nodded. Um, and he started to walk over towards the bed. And at this point, I'm like, oh, "What is happening?" Um, and he's reached out and gone to touch my leg and at that point I completely freaked out and threw the blankets over my head and stayed that way until I must have fallen back asleep or or something but um yeah they they obviously weren't there when I when I woke up oh wow. um, but yeah and Amy um I remember I prodded you on this when we when we met but could you perhaps um scour your memory for what sort of physicality or, or non-physicality they had? Like did they look wispy or did they look three-dimensional? Um, I, I, they, they just looked like people and I guess they, they – I knew that they were ghosts though. So, I'm, yeah, from, me, from memory I, I don't know why I, I knew. Mm-hmm. Like there must have been something about them that, that gave off that, that feeling. Sorry, my daughter is up there. I don't know what okay. she's up to. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just. So you knew, you knew. and I, I just knew. And tell me, what's your memory of what they were wearing? Um, they were wearing, it was definitely, and this is my daughter. Hello. Hello. Oh, aren't you lovely? It's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Nice to meet you too. Oh, she's cool. <laughs> it, it was. It was definitely not clothes from from that time. Yep. Which was what, the early nineties. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. So, uh, definitely an old, older style, older style fashion. Okay. Um. Yeah. I. I couldn't. I don't think I could pinpoint exactly when, but I know it was older yeah sort of um I think at the time we um we thought it might have been sort of turn of the century to, uh, sort of early you know around yeah. the 1900s yeah. or late 1800s yeah. yes yes around there and I think you from memory you'd said the lady was wearing a scarf is that right or somebody yes. was wearing a scarf Yes, I think she she had a scarf over over her head. That's right. That's so, what I remember yeah. you saying. Yeah. Yes. And and another detail that's just occurred to me, you said that they were quite dressed up and you used Yeah, the and their Sunday best. Their Sunday like, best. Yes. Wow. Like they they I don't know if they had just been to church or yeah. if they they'd been to some kind of celebration or something like that. They were definitely they definitely uh, weren't dressed in kind of rags. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember what you'd been doing prior to going to sleep? I don't really remember. I know we'd been playing throughout the day and we went to sleep in in the boys' room um, because there was a bigger bed in there. So I I knew, um, I remember sharing, sharing the room with a couple of her brothers and yeah, I, I remember because the the bed was up against the wall, and Martha, my friend, was sleeping near the wall, and I was I was on the edge, 
Yeah, so and we just had our normal our normal play. I'd play with her, I'd play with her brothers, we would get up to all sorts of mischief. <laughs> um, uh, playing hide and seek, tips, you know, all of that. Barbies. Barbies, <laughs> My Little Pony. Wow. Yeah. All little girl games and then obviously games that, you know, was the boys were interested in as well. So so were the boys sleeping in the room as well when you saw the family? Yes. Oh, do you know that's a detail I didn't know? That's interesting. So there were two other little boys in there, were there? Yes. That intrigues me because because of what happened with a little boy appearing to you and yeah. it kind of makes me wonder about why he was drawn. But anyway, let's let's just continue unpacking exactly what happened. But um, so two other little boys were sleeping in that room. So it was yes. four, four kids. Yes. And how old were the boys? Do you remember? Younger than us. I'm just trying to remember if the youngest was in there. If it was one younger and one older. One was a, a, a year younger than us. Okay. And if the youngest was in there, he was probably only a couple of years younger than us. I'd, I'd say at that point he probably would have been. Um, Martha had four four brothers, so she was the two older and two younger brothers. Um, she was she was the middle child and the girl. So um, and, and we always played with the with four of the um, three of the boys. Okay. Um, the oldest brother was probably too old for <laughs> to enjoy our fantasy yeah. make believe games. My Little Pony, yes. Yeah, um, My Little Pony. Yeah. And so, Amy, you were around eight, is that right? Uh, around seven or eight, I okay. think, yeah. So what about the weather? What sort of night was it? What was it like? Do you remember? No, I, I, I don't really remember because I, I couldn't even tell you what time of year it was. I know I had a doona on me, okay. but from what I can recall, I don't think I was in winter pyjamas, so... It definitely wasn't like the the typical Wellington disgustingly hot night that we get in the summers. Okay. Um. So it was yeah. It was it was just a nice night from what I recall. Okay. Okay. It wasn't too hot to throw a blanket over my head. That's for sure. <laughs> so was there any sense prior to this happening that something extraordinary was about to happen? Was there any feeling? Any any no. hint? Okay. No. No, de- definitely, definitely not. I, I, I got up to go to the bathroom, I came back, and as I got back into bed, there they were. And it was definitely not something I knew was coming or could feel coming on at all. And that's particularly intriguing because you had gotten up to go to the bathroom, so you were wide awake. This is no yeah. dream. You had no just... dream. Definitely not, and I was definitely awake. Wow. So what do you think was your first thought in your mind when you clapped eyes on the family? I think my first reaction was, like, oh, oh my God. And I just, I remember that, that feeling right in your chest of when something unexpected happens or, you're shocked and you're just like, I just, I, yeah, I was in shock, I think. Wow. So that sense of almost losing your breath, like a gas. Yeah. Yeah. Such a shock, such a profound shock. Yes, because, you know, I mean, they were a big family and, you know, these people I, w- I was not expecting in my room, um, especially that time of night and I was just, and I'd never seen them before and I knew that they weren't supposed to be there. So I was just like, why are you in my room? Well, I mean, it wasn't my room, but that's where I was sleeping. Like, why are you here? Yes. And would you hazard a guess at what time it was? Do you think it was r- right in the middle of the night, say 3 a.m. or more, or a bit earlier perhaps? Was everybody in the house asleep? Everyone was asleep. It was dark. Yeah, so I... I couldn't tell you what time it was because I'm pretty sure at that age I couldn't tell the time because I recall probably not long after that 
my dad trying to teach me the time and him getting very frustrated at me. <laughs> um, but it was it was definitely it was the middle of the night at some point after everyone had gone to bed. Okay, okay. So now let's get into what they looked like. Um, I'd love you to describe for our listeners, please, Amy, in as much detail as you can, what they looked like. So let's talk about their height, their features, their hair colour, their expressions. So I, they were, they definitely weren't dressed in clothes from that point in time. It was I, looking at them, I definitely knew it was they were dressed in clothes from the olden days or okay. or whatever. Um, they looked like they were dressed in their Sunday best. The mum had a scarf tied around her head. Um, so I didn't see her hair colour. I, I, from what I recall, I think I'm pretty sure that the the dad had dark hair. Okay. And I I, I don't recall what colour hair the boy had. Although he would be he should be the one that sticks out the most in my mind. The and it was the way they were standing. They were kind. Of, they were standing in height order. So the dad was standing on my right, and then mum was in the middle, and then the son was next to her. But it's uh, my my memory of the the little minute details is not is not fantastic. I'm sorry. Oh, look, that's absolutely understandable. I mean, you're doing really well with all the details that you're giving me. I'm just trying to draw a bit more out of you because the listeners will just think, why didn't she ask this and that? I know I'd be doing the same. And um, Amy, in the story, when I wrote it in Spirit Sisters, I did the same. I tried to drag as many details out of you as I could. You thought that perhaps the boy was about your age or maybe 10 ma- maximum, I think? Yes. Okay. Yes, definitely around my age and definitely no older than 10. Okay. And you thought the parents looked to be in their 30s? Yes, I, I, I would say so. Okay. Which probably at the time felt like they were super old. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm in my 30s, not that old. <laughs> not that old. I remember in Spirit Sisters I wrote about the expression that the dad had and I, I'm not going to say it to you right now. I'm just, I, I just want to probe you to see if you can remember what, the, the expression that the father had on his face. I, I really, I don't remember. I'm sorry. That's all right. You told me he looked stern. Oh, well, I, <laughs> I, I was actually going going to say that he looked serious, but I was go. like, well, I, I don't want to say that. And no. go, hmm, am I just making it up? But, no. yeah, no. no, I was going, I was thinking, oh, he did look serious, but I was like, mm, I'm not going to say something that is – completely off because I'm like I haven't I really can't remember oh you're doing so well and was it immediately apparent to you that this was a family that they were a family unit yes okay yeah and that's just a, a knowledge that was just that you just knew yeah okay yes is it just the way even though they were Standing there, you could you could feel it. You could feel that they they were a family. Okay. I, I, and I can't explain it any better than that. Oh, that's fine. I mean, very often in these encounters, there's sort of a telepathic understanding. There's very rarely you know words spoken with the mouth. Did they? Do you feel like they communi- communicated anything to you apart from this sense of them being a family? I always think that maybe they tried to, mm. especially when I saw the mum bend down and whisper to her son and he came over to the bed, it was like they they did want to communicate something with me but I wasn't ready to hear it, didn't want to hear it. Yes. Terrified. Terrified. Uh, again, understandable. Now let's talk about the quality of the apparitions themselves. So did these look like flesh and blood people or... Did they have a certain transparency, like the classic idea of a ghost that most people would have? I don't. It, it wasn't like you could. I could see through them because I could. I could see what they were wearing, but you could tell that the. It was kind of like they had a, a ghostly appearance. Okay. Um, okay. but not in the sense of I can put my hand right through you. 
but I knew that I probably could. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was yeah, it, it was yes, very obvious that they were there. But yeah, there was this, there was just something about them that was like, no, not like me. Not like me, yeah. So you understood as a little girl who'd never, who'd had interesting experiences prior, but never anything like this. You understood that these were not human flesh and blood people, like relatives yeah. of your friends standing there. Yeah. You immediately knew that, okay. Yes. Was there any colour to them or was it more kind of a colourless? No, there, there was colour. The the dad was wearing, his suit was kind of like a dark, maybe even like a dark blue suit, possibly. I don't, yeah. I, I don't recall any other details about the mum's clothes except except for the scarf the scarf sticks out yeah and and the little boy being like kind of dressed up like a, a little man in his little suit okay but there yeah it, it wasn't like it was in shades of gray or anything like that okay okay was were they sort of their own light source like I'm just wondering how dark it was in that room or whether there was a night lamp on somewhere or or, or were your eyes still a bit used to the dark because you'd walked through the dark house but you could see them no problem could see them no problem night lights we didn't really have them I don't know if there was any other light on in the house I think my eyes had just adjusted well enough because I had been up and you know I I knew their house as well as I knew my house Uh but yeah I, I suppose it would be kind of like that they had their own light source because it wasn't like they were in the shadows it was it was definitely like almost like the the bedroom light could have been on except everywhere else it was still dark That's but interesting. I still I could still see them very clearly okay as I was reading back through the story that I wrote based on our first interview a decade ago you described them as glowy they were glowy yeah <laughs> there we go <laughs> Now, Amy, how far away from you do you think they were? Well, the room wasn't very big. I would say only a couple of metres. That's close. And how long? I know you both stared, the family stared at you and you stared at them for a, a time. How long do you think you stared at each other for silently? Uh, it felt like a long time, but I, it probably wasn't as long as it felt. Okay. But I know... When he started to walk over towards me, that kind of felt like it took a long, a long time too, because you, you know, walking a, a couple of meters wouldn't take long at all. But it, it, that felt like it was almost in slow motion, but not the crazy movie type, you know. <laughs> Thank <laughs> so, goodness. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. It was almost like time didn't matter when, when I think back at it because when I think about it, I know it couldn't have lasted more than, you know, a few a few minutes even, but it definitely felt like it lasted a lot longer than that. Okay, that's, that's fascinating, yes. Often, you know, in these kinds of encounters, time does seem to stretch and walk. That's interesting. So he walked over, maybe took a couple of steps, this little boy. Yeah. Put, put his finger out, didn't he, to, to touch you? He, he reached he, his hand out to touch um, my leg and at that point I was like, no, and threw the blanket over my head um, so, and that's where it stayed. And that's where it stayed. <laughs> Do you know if he actually got to touch you to make contact with your leg? Um, no. I, 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 I think once I, it was like I threw that blanket over my head and I broke whatever connection they had to me. It was... It was like I, they weren't there anymore. I didn't feel anything. Yeah, oh, yeah. That blanket was my barrier, and they weren't there anymore. So you, do you think you fell asleep at that point with your blanket over your head, or so you never took a peek? Did you lie awake for a long time? I think I lay awake for a while, but I don't know how long because, yeah, I kept that blanket over my head until I fell asleep. Whether it was, I, I don't know how long. It, it was 
And was your heart beating fast or were you, in retrospect, relatively calm considering what you'd just seen? I think that initial shock when I first saw them, I think that's that's probably when I was like, <gasps> yeah. yeah, you know, my heart was probably beating the hardest. And when, and when he um, put his hand out and I was thinking, no, <laughs> uh, I think that may have been another heartbeat heartbeat um heart beating hard moment yeah right it's throwing that blanket over my head but once the blanket was over I think it calmed me down a fair amount just being that that barrier yes just having the barrier and do you think that you felt comforted as well knowing you weren't alone in the room that you had Martha sleeping next to you and at least one of the boys yes yes yeah. And, you know, Ma Martha was asleep. She didn't even stir the, <laughs> the entire time. <laughs> oh, gosh. So what was the first thought in your mind when you woke up the next day? My first thought was there was a family in my room. I need to tell someone someone about it. And I remember telling uh, Martha's parents first thing in the morning what I'd seen and they – didn't really pay any mind to it. I don't think they believed me. <laughs> wow. And so you think you told Martha's parents before you told Martha? I think so. Okay. I think so. Because we, we kind of had a tradition of going into their room of a morning when we were woke, woke up. Yeah. So I, I dare say I would have, if it, if it wasn't just her parents, it was probably everyone because we would have all been in there. Ah, so you might have told everyone at the same time. Yeah. What do you think you told them? That there was a family in my room. I probably would have said, yes, they were ghosts. And I told them what happened and, and I don't think it was. They were just like, okay, Amy. <laughs> Even Martha? Um, I think Mar Martha was freaked out by that sort of stuff. Okay. Yeah. And how did your young mind process what you'd just experienced? Like, how did you explain this to yourself? I knew that they were ghosts. Okay. Um, or spirits. But the, I think that the best way I processed it was talking to my parents about it and I guess having them accept it and talk it through with me was like okay yes this is what happened I, I I don't know I just I just knew that that's what it was and it was kind of like it was my brain normalized it, it was just like it, it happened and that was it maybe that you being so so little helped in that process I think so yeah. I think so because kids are resilient yeah. they they bounce back from so much. Oh, yes, it's very true. And accepting as well, of, yes. and especially of, you know, a potential greater reality or something yes. beyond the physical. They accept it perhaps more readily than we do. Did you reflect on the little boy and what he might have been trying to do when he reached out to you? Yes, all, all the time. I, I always think what would have happened if I didn't put the blanket over my head, what was he wanting from me? Did he plan on asking me something or was his mum just giving him courage to come over and say hello? Mm. And I suppose I, I'll always have that tiny bit of regret yeah, throwing, yeah. The, throwing the blanket over my head, although it didn't stop me doing it the next time. <laughs> oh, yes, became the tried and true method. Yes, but yeah, when, when I when I look back, um, look back and think about it, I I always wonder what it was, what his intention was, and you know, I always wonder why that family was there, what had happened to them, but their answers that I never actively um, searched for, yeah. but just just something that I occasionally go, you know, I wonder about. So you think about him from time to time, his little boy? Yeah, yeah. Um, probably less these days than I than I did previously because my my time is definitely uh, taken up. <laughs> oh, yes, it sure is. 
So, yeah, so that's interesting that you have this feeling that you could have perhaps done more to try and understand what it, it was yeah. that drew them to you. Yes. My my mum always has said that they they were drawn to me because when I left home to go to uni, the things that the house stopped and she said, well, they, they followed me to uni and and it felt like they did for, for a time but it, it slowly kind of, you know, died off okay. and, yeah. And if you could just sum up what kinds of things were going on in the house before you went away to uni. A lot of it had to do, for the most part, to do with my parents' room and their bed. I know it got bumped or shook and I know mum used to hear things like it, like a party was happening it, in, in the drain, I used to have to fall asleep with headphones in listening to music because it, it always, when I was trying to sleep, it always felt like it was really loud. What, okay. what was really loud, Amy? Voices? Just, vo- yeah, voices. Yeah. Sounding crazy now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember you telling me this and I remember your mum telling me and you had said that it sounded like voices a little bit distant as if in another room. Yes. And then I would hear very clearly my name being said. Um, and to block that out, I would put in my headphones and um, listen to music, to, and that would be the only way I could fall asleep easily. Well, as you know, throughout my three books, I've interviewed lots of natural mediums uh, like you, and that's what I think you are, if I could, if, if I could suggest that. And often they would say that you know natural mediums just shine like a light to to the spirit world and they are drawn to you they see you and they want to get through but I completely understand why it would be unsettling and you'd put your headphones in as a young woman or you know teenager even going Mm -hmm. through this it it would be unsettling yes and I did at the time I spoke with your mum and she told me a little bit about the experiences that they'd had there was even the, the idea that potentially your dad has gifts as well and you inherited them. I remember that she told me a story about your dad seeing um, a little boy running around their house. Yeah. And, yes, I wonder about that, about you perhaps inheriting those gifts from your from your dad. Yeah. I, I mean, we've, we've had – I haven't had anything physical like that happen – in a long time, but I've had a couple of dreams where you know, a really good family family friend passed away from lung cancer. You know, may, a week or a few weeks later, I had a dream and he was he was there, and you know, I said, John, what you know, what what are you doing here? You're not you're not supposed to be here. And he said, you know, I just want you to let my girls know that I'm okay. Everything's okay. And, you know, I rang, you know, when I woke up the next day, I'm like, Mum, John came to, he came to, and she's like, what? She's like, well, you, you need to tell, you know, his wife. And I'm like, oh, you know, I, I yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you can't, people look at you weird, especially if they're non-believers and, yeah. Um, so I, I never actually passed on that message I'm not sure if my mum did okay. at, a, at a later stage yeah. um but I didn't personally um and then in in 2011 my my nephew passed away um tragically Sorry, and a, a few weeks probably only two weeks after after that you know I had I had a dream and there was this lady there and she she said you know someone's here to see you and I and I said, you know, James, and she's like, yes. Um, so I've turned around and there he was, but um, he was 19 when he passed away, but when he came to me in my dream, he was only young, five or six. And she, I looked at her and she looked really confused. She's like, oh, I'm like, no, 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 this is this is James, that's James. Um, and I, you know, I was got really emotional and yeah. he came to me and he hugged me and he said, Amy, I'm okay, everything is okay. And, you know, I woke up and and funnily enough, you know, a couple of weeks after that, 
I went and I saw a medium and she's she's bringing him through. He's coming through as he did in my dream as a five or six-year-old and, and she was confused because when I told her that he was 19 when he passed away, she's like, but, oh, he's coming through as just a little boy. And I said, and I explained to her about my dream. She said, oh, my God. She said that ex- it, it explains so much. And I just I just found it so amazing that this, you know, this woman in my dream was confused about how he was appearing to me and he appeared and he came through the exact same way. Wow. Who do you think that woman in your dream was that was presenting him to you? I, I don't know. Um, she was in my dream. She was an older lady. I'm not sure she. she I didn't recognise her. Okay, so um, potentially she may have been someone in his life or of yeah. yours. <laughs> or oh yours. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely could have been. Um, yeah, an ancestor of, of mine. But yeah, I, I didn't recognise her. Why do you think that he was presenting in both of those situations as a boy of five or six? From what I understand. He came to me at that age because his happiest memories with me are from that age because we spent – because he was only seven years younger than me. So we spent a lot of time together growing up and so many sleepovers with him and his older sister and, you know, we played together so much and I think think that's – that's the reason. That makes sense because there's a resonance, there's a real heart connection there. So Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, they they really are fantastic memories. Oh, Amy. Well, I'm so sorry for that loss. Do you think that having that dream was a comforting experience for you in your grief? I think so. Um, I mean, still to this day, I I think I'm in a lot of denial about it because I (laughs) – Because I, I, I don't think of him as, as soon as I think of him as gone, I get upset. So yeah. most of the time it's he's away. Yeah. Um, but at the time it was definitely um, a lot of comfort. Well, that's the reason I wrote my third book, Love Never Dies. And I guess looking back, it's the reason why I wrote all of my books, because those experiences that I share, that my, my interviewees like you share, even if they have an overtone of something spooky, something inexplicable. I think um, the undercurrent is always one of hope because they speak of a reality beyond our senses and that's what drew me in, the fascination about a reality beyond our senses is what drew me in as a little kid. And I think that um, that, that's still what they've got, these experiences have to offer us is, is that hope, you know, and... Looking yeah. back on your own history of um, of having these these experiences, which at, at the time I called paranormal, and now I'm kind of thinking they're more normal, as in a part of humanity. <laughs> yeah. What What do you? How do you look back on your experiences and how they might have helped you look at life? Um, I think I think knowing that this life isn't it and it isn't the end that there is more afterwards I don't know it's it's I think it's allowed me to kind of go into life and and look at you know my experiences in a whole other light I'm not closed-minded you know I'm very open-minded um and I just think you know if I if I didn't have the experiences that I that I have with the spirit world well for starters I I I would probably be in counseling with you know over my nephew I don't think I'd be dealing with it Um, I mean I don't think I'm dealing with it great (laughs) Um, but you know I think him coming to me really really helped with the grieving process and just coming to terms with it at the time Mm -hmm. because it was it was very much a blur you know as, as a kid having that experience it just it just opened up my eyes so much and you know nothing like that has happened in that magnitude since like I've had little things happen but nothing like that you know I don't know whether I'm happy or sad about (laughs) that because you know mum seems to think I I managed to to block it 
block it out or, or maybe they they just – because after, after my first dream about that the family friend and I didn't pass on the message, nothing happened for a long time. Okay. So I, I don't know if it was like she didn't pass on the message, we, we shouldn't – we shouldn't visit her. She's not going to help us. I, you know, I, I don't know. Well, Amy, one thing that I've learned speaking to so many people over the years about this is that there seem to be sort of chapters in our lives that welcome these experiences over other chapters. For instance, yeah. um, childhood seems to be a time when we are more open to this to these experiences yep. because perhaps because you know we haven't been conditioned so much by society ego fears all of that yeah. um, and then you know the very busy years of motherhood and yeah. you know and working marriage like that building a family they can sometimes be quieter times for this because and you know possibly there is the sense that you made that choice subconsciously and but yeah. that doesn't mean that there won't come a time again when things are more settled in your life, you have more space and time um, that, you know, this channel will be reopened. I mean, and I don't think it's closed from what you're saying anyway, you know. So that's something to consider as well. But I think that was such a powerful statement of yours that that dream of your nephew has helped you in a way that that you would you would as you said you wouldn't have coped anywhere near as well had you not had that dream and that's the power of these experiences and that's why I wanted to write about them and talk about them in this podcast yeah absolutely yeah um because you know our, our family still struggles with the loss and as far as I'm aware I'm, I'm not sure if anyone else in the family has had him visit them yeah. in the dreams but yeah I, as far as I'm aware, he's only come to me. My understanding is that you can invite more of that communication and it's just, again, it's about the space and time. You've got four small children, you know, it's harder than it sounds to make space <laughs> and time for meditation or prayer, you know. But if, Absolutely. if you did want to, you know, I would suggest some meditation or just some quiet time and you just open your heart and, and invite more of that experience in your dreams or in gentle ways that, you know, that are not too confronting. And then that could potentially happen if that was something. Yeah. Because well. the thing is that he is around you and he's still alive but in a different way, in, in a way that, we, you know, physically you can no longer touch him, but he's around you anyway. Yes, yes, he absolutely is. And, Amy, I remember too when we talked, so you had had the experience with the family, which is never to be repeated in its intensity, not yet <laughs> anyway, uh, but there was also an encounter you had when you were at uni with a gentleman who appeared in your dorm. Do you want to tell us about that again? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I I, um, I woke up um, and there was a, a figure of a, a man standing in my, my doorway in, in my room and I was just like, no, no. <laughs> I was like, go away. And again, I threw the blankets over my head and that was the end of that. I was just like, no. <laughs> that very scientific <laughs> method of throwing the blankets over your yeah, head. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> For me anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just, nope. Yeah, see, uh, it's, I, it's interesting how you can make that choice. You made it then, you know. Oh, I, I did and I was very <laughs> firm about it. I was like, mm -mm, no. <laughs> wow. Wow. I, I am not up for this right now. <laughs> and he he looked very physical, just like a man standing in your, your room, didn't he? And I think he was leaning against the bookshelf or something like yes. that. Yes. Yes, he was. Wow. Yeah, cause there, there was a, a bookshelf attached to the wall, so it wasn't on the ground. It was high, higher up, and oh, okay. he was just kind of resting against, against it because it was – as you walked in into my room, it was like right there on the wall. So yeah, I was just like, no, no. Wow. <laughs> and do you have any idea who he was? None, no. Or um, and I and to be honest, I I didn't really look into it. I didn't question it. I was just like, no. and you know, I I never never saw him again either. Okay. And so, Amy, 
I'm trying to think if we if there were any other experiences that you told me about. And I think um, there were some when you were little as well. You'd seen, did, was it you that saw a teenage boy in, in your family home? Yes, I, I'd gone down to get a drink and I'd come back up the hallway, started to come back up the hallway and out of the corner of my eye I saw movement in our lounge room and I turned around and there was this um, young boy just walking around our lounge room and he oh, wow. and he just went to sit down on the armchair and I was just like, and I'm off. <laughs> and I ran up to ran up to my room. I, I didn't even stick around much for that one either. Do you remember how old you were when that yeah. one happened? It was it was after the family across the road, so it might have been a year later. It's a lot for a primary school child to be dealing with, I guess. Yeah. Did you, I, I'm sure you did talk to your mum about both experiences. What did, as a child, what did mum and dad say to you then? They just pretty much got me to talk to them in detail okay. about it. Pro- probably more more mum. I mean, dad, dad's always been like a believer, but not someone who kind of goes out and will have a conversation about it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it was mostly mostly my mum that I spoke to about it, um, and and yeah, it was just just normal conversation, normal <laughs> normal conversations about it. We we never really looked into the history of where we lived or anything like that. We 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 never really looked into who he could be, but you know, it was it was just a fun, spooky subject that we bring up every few months and have a chat about yes it's interesting actually that you use that word fun to describe it because as a child myself reading not really having these experiences although there was one that I write about on the first page of spirit sisters but mainly reading about these experiences as a kid of about the age that you were when you saw the family there was a sense of fun and and almost um sort of joy or exuberance in in this possibility you know that there's it's almost like a treasure hunt or a big secret that we're not in on you know and it's fun to try and decipher that so was that the sense you had as well sharing these experiences growing up yeah definitely definitely not when I had the experience I didn't think it was fun then but but having having that experience and Fit, like it was unique yeah. to me and you know no one else in my family had had experiences like that and yeah it, it was fun and exciting to talk about because you know they they found it fascinating and exciting so you know being able to share that with them mm. it yeah it was fun and that's a very important aspect of this you know conversation isn't it just to be able to share in a safe way and not be shut down yeah, you know? so absolutely. Would you encourage um, anybody who's listening who has a family member who has these experiences to, to listen without prejudice? Yeah, I think even if you don't believe in it, I think it's really important to, to listen and try and have an open mind because, you know, one day when they have something really, you know, something else important to to tell you it may not be about the the paranormal or anything like that but you you don't want to give them you don't want to shut them down because if you shut them down about this one thing you know what happens when something really important comes up you don't you don't want to have that experience that oh well you shut you you didn't listen to me before you know why would you listen to me this time and you know it's important especially with with children it's 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 important to have you know that open and free communication and if you don't believe them let them get it off their chest they need to talk about it because you 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 don't want them to be frightened by it and you know if they if they're talking about it they'll they'll see that that fun side that I you know I grew to see as well yes because as you say like when you in the heat of the experience of seeing the family you were afraid Oh, absolutely. Yeah, naturally, because I, I always remember I got you to draw that stick figure for me. You drew an illustration. You didn't want to, but I said, come on, have a go. And you drew an illustration of what it was like. You know, you had bed and then the wall. And what I always remember from that illustration is, goodness me, it would have been a squeeze in there. 
you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that in itself is very confronting. Yes. It, like when, when I look back on it, it wasn't a huge room. My artistic skills have not improved. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think, because I guess the, one of the most unique aspects of your story is that interactive element. They didn't just... They weren't just a wispy vision. They seemed to be as curious about you as you were about them. Yeah. Ten years later, do you have any thoughts on what perhaps that little boy was going to do or what his mother said to him that prompted him to, to take a step and try and give you a little poke with his finger? <laughs> uh, you know, I think that's probably one of the regrets of my fear, not finding out what they wanted but I think given you know not everyone can see um, them I, I think perhaps they were surprised that I I, I did see them um, and maybe yeah as you said they were probably just as curious about me as I was frightened of them <laughs> so oh, may, maybe they were scared too I don't know well not not as scared because the boy you know the boy had wasn't scared to come over to me but yes, I think yeah, I think they were they were just just curious to to see that you know someone could see them and acknowledge them in in the world. Amy, it's also just occurred to me um, that you, earlier when you were telling me about your dreams, I thought, oh, there was another dream that you had that was very very profound. As a young younger woman, you're still a very young woman. As a younger woman, about. Um, a concentration camp. Do you want to tell us about that? Yes. Um, I, when I was young, again, um, I used to have this recurring nightmare and I'd wake up crying all the time. It was like um, a concentration camp and my parents were were in this camp and I and it was like I was on the other side of the fence and I was watching them be killed, you know, over and over I, I would have this dream. You know, I, I assume it was from a, a previous life, mm. but, it, um, yeah, it, it went for a couple of weeks and then I never had it again. Okay. And were you around that age, at the age you were when you saw the family? Yeah. Ah, okay, so you weren't a young woman, you were also a child. So a lot happened in those childhood years, those years of eight, nine. So has that given you any kind of um, inspiration to explore the idea of past lives or explore, like what happens when you watch World War II material or read about it? How do you feel? You know, any, anything like that, you know, make, makes me really, really sad. But, you know, I'm, I'm pretty emotional in anything that anything like anything sad in movies and TV shows now what like, really affects me more than um, I think it used to. And I don't know if that's motherhood or, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. or, or what, but yeah, like I, I, I don't have any um, PTSD responses if, if, if that's what, what you mean. Like I don't have reactions like that. Just yeah, just um, just emotional and and yeah, just that feeling of sadness. Let's yeah, anything that's sad in in shows, whether it be war movies or animal movies. <laughs> <laughs> could be anything actually your empathy um that you described reminds me like I remember when we met I felt that about you that you you are such a caring person like, it comes through immediately and it's almost as if that empathy of yours and that big embrace of care reaches beyond our physical world and the beings and the life beyond the physical world that we can see it's almost like they sense it too that you care <laughs> quite possibly because <laughs> I I I do, I feel like I take on people, when people are sad around, I take on that sadness. I, I, I find it more especially with sadness. You know, when people are happy, I'm, I'm happy, of course, but I definitely feel it more when there's that sorrow and, and, and sadness. But, yeah, like if, if someone's crying, I will cry with them. Yeah, I, I definitely, definitely feel it all. <laughs> And I remember, I remember sensing that about you, and it's almost as if that caring side of you does draw these, whether they're lost or whether they're seeking something in the other world worlds. It's almost like that draws them to you. Uh, it's a nice thought. I, I hope so because you know, 
if if I could offer offer them anything, I would I would love to be able to offer them some comfort and closure. Mm. And so I wonder, Amy, how has this led you onto a path of inquiry, a spiritual journey of any kind to try and establish what is behind these experiences? Um, I've reached out to probably you know a couple of mediums in the past, you know, ho- hoping to to kind of find some answers, but. I also don't ask specific questions because I always feel that I will be told what I need to be told. Because yeah, it's like when I when I saw saw the the medium after my nephew passed away, she asked me if I had anything anything specific I I wanted to know, and I said you know just tell me what comes through because if it doesn't come through, I'm not meant to know. So, you know, she described my partner who I'd met, but we, we weren't involved at the time. And when I think back to what she said, it, you know, it was him to a T. So, yeah. Have you ever had a medium say to you, what are you doing here? You, you can do this yourself. She said, and she, she told me, you know, you, you feel things. And at the time I was working in the hospitality industry and she, and she told me, you need to get out of that environment because it is draining your life away. So I, I probably stuck around in that job for a few more months and I was gone. Yeah. Uh, but other than, other than what, what she said, I, I know mum has been, been told that I have a gift mm-hmm. when she's, um, spoken to a medium before, but I, sometimes I think that I, I've closed it closed it off too mu- too much. That I would like to explore it more, but maybe I don't. I don't know. Yes, that's the thing. Yeah, but you know, I, I think your philosophy of when the time is right, it will happen, and and if I'm meant to know something, I'll be given that information. I think you know that's all. That's all on the right track, you know, and I think if more of us could take on that kind of surrendering way of being, you know, our lives will probably flow a bit easier. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, I, I, I know if you you push too hard for information, it's you're just going to upset the balance. <laughs> yeah. And, Amy, what does your partner say? Does he know the story of the family? Um, well, when I told him that um, I was having this interview, um, he said, "What? What for?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, you know that that book that I that I, I did an interview for." And he said, "What book?" I said, Sasha, "Sasha, I've told you about this book before." And he's like, "What was it about? What, what was it about?" <laughs> and I I told him, and he's like, "Oh yeah, okay." He's not as open minded. Uh, but I mean, he's not completely closed off to it either. Yeah, now I mean, he he's from he's from uh, he was born in Croatia, and his family, you know, came here to escape the war over there in the in the early nineties. So you know, he's much more real and down to earth about a lot of things. Yeah, yes, that's understandable. And what about your little ones? Do they ever hint at any? any questions or any experiences or they're still too little I think they're still too they they do have a lot of questions about James my nephew yeah. and you know what happened to him and Olivia especially she asks lots of questions about what happened where is he and things like that but apart from when she was little and down I, I'd put her down for for a nap in it like she was staring up and having a good little chat to someone, which I which I got on video. It was, you know, it was pretty cool. I thought, you know, I thought, oh, maybe, you know, she's talking to James. You know, yeah. that that was that was my hope anyway. Um, but I haven't really noticed anything anything with them since then. I mean, they're they're always on the go. They're so loud. I don't know how they would have any any um, chance to to communicate or have any experience with that. Oh, my goodness. And so, Amy, when they ask you where James is, what do you say? What's your answer? My answer is, is that he's in heaven, you know, that he, you know, he's, he's not with us anymore he, and he's, he's gone up to heaven to be with, you know, with God. And, and, you know, a lot of the time I'm not sure if I, especially when, when James passed away, is my 
um, belief in in that in that kind of faltered, and I, I'm not sure if I if I believe in in God as this entity, but I I know that there's something where whether it's God or whether it's something else entirely, I I know there's something beyond beyond us and you know if you if you want to give him the name god then yes i'm <laughs> you know that's how i refer to him but whether he's god as as the bible describes i'm i'm, I'm not so big on the religion of it but the more, more the spiritual yeah yeah i mean i'm i i'm with you on that i find that those three little letters are way too small to encompass concept that we cannot even begin to get our heads around, you know. Lately I've been so interested in near-death experiences and I've read many, many accounts of these people who've passed away momentarily, visited another realm, often spoken with a being of light and come back. And that is the theme of these experiences is that we do not have the language. We are just like little babies scrabbling around to try and describe the immensity of this concept and this force of love. Yeah. So that's how I, I think of it as, a, as an, a hugely creative, benevolent force of love. And um, that's, um, I'm with you on that, that it's very difficult to try and put into language. And the near-death experiences agree with you. Yeah, well, um, I, I know my grandmother had one of those because she, ha- she had a heart condition and she was one of the first, I think, the first person who had a pig valve, oh, heart okay. valve put, in, um, uh, put into her. But uh, apparently she had a, a, a near-death experience and she saw the light as well. But, um, but yeah, I, I know the, va- the vague details. Yeah, and she, she was, um, I think, I don't know if she was religious before that, but she was really just after that she definitely I love what you say about knowing that there is something beyond and you you know you know because you've seen you've seen something that can't be explained yeah do you think that that's the ultimate benefit seeing the family is to set you up from a young age to to have this understanding or what do you think is the biggest gift of seeing the family I I think you're completely right just giving me the, the understanding that there there is more beyond this physical world. And it's definitely um, piqued my imagination over the years. And I think, yeah, I, I, I think it's definitely allowed me to, to have that open mind in life. And I, I think having an open mind in is definitely a gift. I yeah. agree with you more, Amy. Now, before we go, is there any other thought or any other reflection that you've had about your experiences, about the family, or anything else at all that you'd like to share with us? Oh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had something beautiful and prof- profound to say, but oh, I don't, I'm not very good with words. Yeah, I, I think I think all of my experiences as a child, and in, in, you know, in in my life, I think led up to to that that moment that I had with my nephew after he passed away in my dream and I think if I hadn't have had all of those experiences I and had an open mind and an open heart to to that that world that you know the life beyond what we see I don't think I would have had that with him I don't think he would have been able to come through I don't think I would have been given that little bit of closure and that little bit of comfort, and I think it all led up to that to that moment. Thing, things happen in life when they're meant to happen, and it sucks. It was it was clearly his time, and you know, obviously, when it's our time, it's our time, and and that was probably known from from day dot and yeah every everything I experienced got me ready for that moment with him if I hadn't had those experiences I I wouldn't have got got that moment and I wouldn't have been able to share that moment with my family exactly oh well thank you so much for sharing it with us today it's been such a joy to see your lovely face again (laughs) (laughs) even though our listeners don't have the benefit (laughs) 
and to hear your hear your story one once more and to um to gather your reflections over the last decade you know and to hear about how your life's changed it's been absolutely wonderful to catch up amy and i'm very grateful for your time today no, thank, thank you thank you for your time thank you Thank you for listening to Spirit Sisters, the podcast, based on my best-selling book of the same name. I really hope you enjoyed this episode and will join me again next time for another intriguing conversation exploring mysteries and marvels. In the meantime, please subscribe so that you won't miss an episode. I also welcome your feedback, so please message me through my website, karinamachado.com, or find me on Facebook at Karina Machado Author. Perhaps you have your own encounter to share. If so, I'd love to hear it. After all, there's nothing more powerful than a story.